Trophoblastic disease arises from a fertilized ovum that forms abnormal trophoblastic tissue, but no fetus. Gestational trophoblastic disease covers a spectrum of conditions with pregnancy as the common antecedent. The disease can occur in any type of pregnancy, including ectopic, full-term, spontaneous abortion, and pregnancies resulting from in vitro fertilization. It is preceded by a molar pregnancy in 50% of cases. Gestational trophoblastic disease includes hydatidiform mole, invasive mole, placental site trophoblastic disease, and choriocarcinoma. All are associated with elevated levels of human chorionic gonadotropin. Approximately 20% of patients will develop persistent trophoblastic disease after evacuation of a molar pregnancy. Persistent trophoblastic disease requires chemotherapy. Good prognosis disease can be successfully treated with a single agent chemotherapy, while poor prognosis disease requires combination therapy. Looking more closely at the subtypes, we can divide hydatidiform mole into a partial, which is going to have evidence of an embryo. Uh, it's going to be triploid in karyotype. Uh, it may be a slow gestational period, and it will present as a missed abortion, as opposed to a complete hydatidiform mole where no fetus will form. It will be uh, 46XX with all chromosomes coming from the paternal origin, either through an empty egg being fertilized by a sperm that divides or by two sperm. An invasive mole has local extension into the uterus or vagina. The choriocarcinoma is going to be uh, malignant, often distant metastases to lung, liver, brain, or vagina most often. And placental site trophoblastic tumor is the most rare. In this slide, we can see some of the characteristics of partial and complete hydatidiform moles. Some contributory or predisposing factors to molar pregnancies include a previous molar pregnancy. After having one molar pregnancy, the risk of another is about 1%. Uh, the risk goes up to about 1 in 6.5 for women who have had two molar pregnancies. Age is another significant factor with women under 15 years old or over 40 years old having a higher significant uh, having a significantly higher incidence. 1 in 1000 pregnancies will be a molar pregnancy and possibly as high as 1 in 77 in studies in Indonesia. Gestational trophoblastic neoplasia is preceded by hydatidiform mole in 50% of the patients. Symptoms and signs of hydatidiform mole. The most common symptom that will uh, be present in a hydatidiform mole is vaginal bleeding occurring in 80 or greater percent of patients. Excessive uterine size for gestational age. Thecal luteal cysts of the ovaries may be detected by sonography or potentially by palpation. Other conditions such as preeclampsia, hyperthyroidism, and hyperemesis, gravidarum, may occur but are less commonly seen now as diagnosis of molar pregnancy tends to be made earlier in the course of gestation. Other symptoms may be missed or delayed period or passage of aborted vesicular tissue. Uh, this is most common in a partial mole, but you may see grape-like mass in a complete mole. The differential for gestational trophoblastic disease and hydatidiform mole is going to include uh, the other causes of bleeding early in pregnancy, which would include spontaneous abortion, ectopic pregnancies, uh, prolapsed fibroids may present in this way, or other uterine processes. So what lab tests will we order in order to make our diagnostic decision? Uh, beta HCG is going to be uh, one of the best indicators. Uh, it can range from a high normal up to uh, over a million international units. And if this is paired with an enlarged uterus and vaginal bleeding, it would highly suggest a diagnosis of hydatidiform mole. Complete moles will more often have a higher beta-HCG level than partial moles. 
and also with an increase in beta HCG there can be increased uh, thyroid hormone due to the cross reactivity and can result in symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Getting a CBC with platelets, clotting function labs are going to be important to rule out other uh, pathology related to clotting. Uh, getting a creatinine, a liver function test, and thyroid function tests are going to help rule out other diagnoses as well. Uh, the diagnosis is going to be largely supported by ultrasound transvaginally and transabdominally to look for a fetal pole and fetal heart. And uh, a preoperative chest radiograph is going to help identify potential metastases. So in making the diagnosis of a molar pregnancy, uh, what are the treatment plans? So a mole is going to require evacuation by suction curettage as well as a chemotherapeutic treatment. For non-metastatic and good prognosis uh, malignant gestational trophoblastic disease, uh, methotrexate is the agent of choice with weekly doses of 30 to 50 milligrams per meter squared uh, as an intramuscular injection has been found to be the most cost-effective treatment when taking efficacy, toxicity, and cost into consideration. However, a uh, triple therapy is more often needed in women who have poor prognosis malignant gestational trophoblastic disease and uh, this triple therapy will often include methotrexate as its main agent paired with uh, a combination of dactinomycin, chlorambucil, or cyclophosphamide. There are several grading scales to score the risk of the uh, GTD. Uh, the FIGO score is considered to be uh, one of the best because it takes into account uh, some of the most uh, critical factors while leaving out uh, comprehensive lab testing so therefore it's very good across the world. So if we take a look at the FIGO scoring system we can see that age uh, comes into a factor with uh, 39 being a cutoff point, antecedent pregnancy, uh, the different types of pregnancies that uh, have led into uh, this uh, situation with the hydatidiform mole being uh, the least worrisome in a term pregnancy resulting in gestational trophoblastic disease being the most worrisome getting a higher score. Um, the HCG uh, greater than 100,000 is going to get you a score of 4. Uh, tumor sizing, location of metastases, number of metastases, and uh, failure to respond to chemotherapy in the past will all add to your score. Uh, a total score of 0 to 6 is going to have a low risk, while greater than 7 will place you in a high risk category. In addition to the risk score, uh, gestational trophoblastic disease can be divided into the non-metastatic and the metastatic. And here we take a look at the classification that the non-metastatic gestational disease is going to have no evidence of metastases and therefore is not assigned to a prognostic category. Metastatic gestational trophoblastic disease is going to be any extra uterine metastases. A good prognosis metastatic GTD is going to have no risk factors. And you can see here that no mets to the brain or liver, uh, not a term pregnancy, and no prior chemotherapy. Poor prognosis is going to have any of those risk factors. Long duration since the pregnancy, a pre-therapy, HCG level greater than 40,000, brain or liver mets, a term pregnancy leading into it, or prior chemotherapy. So here we take a look at some images of uh, hydatidivore moles with the upper left, lower left, and lower right being complete hydatidivore moles and the upper right being a partial mole. So if we start with the partial mole, we can see that there are parts of a fetus present. Here we can see teeth that have developed a uh, potential limb and if we, if we remember the partial mole will have a triploid karyotype uh, so being 69XXY and if we look at the hydatidiform mole that is complete we see this grape-like clustering mass 
On the ultrasound in the lower left, we see a snowstorm uh, pattern. It looks kind of like a grid or the grape-like mass. And in the upper left, the complete mole, we can see it in relation to the uterus and filling the cavity. So we can see that this is a rapidly dividing mass that can expand the uterus to larger than expected gestational age. So after treatment, what is the follow-up for a hydatidiform mole or gestational trophoblastic disease? So after a suction curatage and initial treatment with methotrexate or a triple therapy, uh, there needs to be a period of follow-up. In that period of follow-up, uh, there's going to be regular HCG levels taken. And this HCG testing should be performed weekly until three consecutive undetectable levels have been obtained, and then monthly for 6 to 12 months. And uh, contraception should be used to prevent a pregnancy uh, until 12 months of remission uh, because a subsequent uh, normal pregnancy cannot be differentiated from a trophoblastic neoplasia by an HCG assay. So therefore, oral contraception uh, may be used unless there's a specific contraindication. A uh, physical exam, including the pelvis, should be performed every two weeks until remission and then every three months for one year. If it is noted that HCG titers reach a plateau or rise, this indicates a persistent or recurrent trophoblastic neoplasia, and referral to a gyne onc uh, is indicated at that time. So in review, um, hydatidiform mole and gestational trophoblastic disease um, so most often is going to arise from a molar pregnancy, with the complete mole being fertilization of an empty egg by a single sperm whose chromosomes reduplicate, a partial mole where a haploid egg fertilized by two sperm, and the rare causes uh, include a placental site trophoblastic tumor, which is very rare, 100 cases reported in the literature. So if we talk about some of ACOG's recommendations, um, a woman of reproductive age with abnormal bleeding or symptoms that could be caused by a malignancy, uh, beta HCG levels should be evaluated to facilitate early diagnosis and treatment of gestational trophoblastic disease. In the case of a molar pregnancy, the preferred method of evacuation is suction DNC. After molar evacuation, all patients should be monitored with serial HCG determinations to diagnose and treat malignant sequelae promptly. Oral contraceptives have been demonstrated to be safe and effective during post-treatment monitoring based on randomized controlled trials. Women with non-metastatic gestational trophoblastic disease should be treated with single-agent chemotherapy, methotrexate. For women with the non-metastatic GTD, a weekly dose of 30 to 50 milligrams per meter squared of an intramuscular dose of methotrexate has been found to be the most cost-effective treatment when taking efficacy, toxicity, and cost into consideration. Women with metastatic gestational trophoblastic disease should be referred to a gynonc. And women with the high-risk metastatic disease should be treated with a multi-agent chemotherapy that will include methotrexate, dactinomycin, and either chlorambucil or cyclophosphamide. Any abnormal bleeding for more than six weeks following a pregnancy should be evaluated with HCG testing to exclude a new pregnancy or gestational trophoblastic disease. Uh, in compliant patients, the low morbidity and mortality achieved by monitoring patients with serial HCG determinations and instituting chemotherapy only in patients with postmolar GTD outweighs the potential risk and small benefit of routine prophylactic chemotherapy. Serious complications are not uncommon in women with uterus size greater than 16-week gestation, so they should be managed by physicians experienced in the prevention and management of GTD complications. So this is uh, the end of our talk on gestational trophoblastic disease arising from uh, molar pregnancies. Thank you.